Morning, and you're listening to WMNF's Tuesday Cafe. I'm Sean Canan, and we turn now to our guest for the rest of the hour. We're going to talk about education issues in Florida, and we're joined by Jessica Vaughn, a member of the Hillsborough County School Board. Welcome back to WMNF's Tuesday Cafe, Jessica. Thank you for having me. It's always an honor to be here. I'm really glad you could come on the show today because there's so much to talk about, about schools and education. Uh, let's start with tomorrow's State Board of Education meeting. It, the Tampa Bay Times reports that it will scrutinize whether 10 school districts, including Miami-Dade, Broward, and Hillsborough counties, are carrying out the state's parental rights law, which has become a political lightning rod in the local school board meetings and in national politics in recent years. So first of all, maybe let's start with that. What is the, um, the, the parental rights law in Florida and how is that impacting the State Board of Education meeting? Well, it's a little bit unclear, and I think that's kind of where the challenge has come. You know, ultimately, it's a law that says, you know, parents have the right to have the decision over every aspect of their children's education. Um, and now they're kind of clarifying a little bit more of what that looks like, whether it comes to LGBTQ plus issues, which are one of the issues that they highlighted saying we're out of compliance, or they're concerned that our equity policy um, uh, is in conflict with the new woke law. Um, so it, that's kind of been part of the challenge is the law was very unclear to begin with. And I feel like they're kind of flushing it out now as we go. But some of the clarity that they're given is so quick that to cite um, districts for being out of compliance without giving a lot of, you know, understanding of what their expectations are feels very confusing, <laughs> to say the least. The superintendents got letters from the Florida Department of Education in Hillsborough County. The in Hillsborough, the state is asking the district to provide an update on two policies, as you mentioned, a racial equity policy that aims to increase academic achievement for all students and LGBTQ policies that deal with coming out confidential, conf confidentially. So, so I want to um, let you clarify this. So the, the district in Hillsborough County has these two policies. One says that when a student comes out as LGBTQ, that the district will deal with that confidential, confidentially, I, he's tried to say. And the <laughs> other is that the, there is a policy of racial equity in the district that's, that aims to increase academic achievement for all students. And so the state is, has told the district that it is scrutinizing the district for those two policies. Correct. And again, there hasn't been a lot of clarity. So we didn't get a lot of clarity on specifically what piece that violates. Um, and we have been working since some of the clarity has come out, you know, with the entire bathroom, because it also states, you know, whether our bathroom policy is out of compliance and what that looks like. And the Board of Education just gave clarity on that in October. Um, you know, it's December. So um, not really having a lot of time to consult with our attorneys, you know, make sure that we're staying in compliance with what the, the ever changing law, but also upholding, you know, the commitment to our families and to our students to make sure that we're keeping everybody safe, that we're being inclusive, um, that we're making sure that equity is a focus within the district. Um, you know, those have all been a priority for this board. So we want to keep that integrity while also staying in compliance. And, you know, without a lot of clarity around all of this, it takes a little while of consulting, relooking at the policies, understanding what they're asking to, to make sure we're in compliance. And I feel that the fact that already letters are being sent out and they're having conversations about districts being out of compliance, again, is short-sighted and not very supportive in nature. I want to remind people that our guest is Jessica Vaughn. She's a member of the Hillsborough County School Board, and you're listening to WMNF's Tuesday Cafe. I'm Sean Canan, and we're talking about education issues in Florida. So far, we've talked about tomorrow's State Board of Education meeting, and uh, the State Board has told superintendents in, in several counties in Florida, including in Hillsborough, that they're under scrutiny in dealing with new Florida laws. Jessica, what can you say about how that law is impacting how, how the school district teachers, for example, are dealing with gender pronouns and names when it comes to students who, are, who, are, uh, who, who have issues, I guess, have, um, are telling them that they want specific gender pronouns or want to use a different name? 
So we haven't actually had a lot of um, incidences with that um, from our equity and diversity office. Um, even previous to the laws coming out, we didn't have a lot of challenges. You know, when we talk about confidentiality in our policy, it's not to withhold information from parents, it's to make sure that we're handling everything um, as sensitively as we can, you know, supporting families, you know, not to hide information, but to also make sure that our students feel safe and supported as well, because ultimately making sure our students are safe has been a number one priority. Again, I haven't had any concerns or complaints um, regarding pronouns. Usually things get escalated to us pretty quickly. Um, I think we're still reviewing that again because all of this is changing so rapidly and we want to make sure that we're in compliance. Honestly, I've had more concerns with, you know, the Board of Education recently passed a law where every teacher in their classroom library has to catalog every piece of material in their library, upload it on a website, make sure that's accessible at all times. And unfortunately, because our teachers are so and our staff members are so exhausted overworked and underpaid what that's really led to is getting rid of classroom libraries um you know and so we've seen a lot more here when it comes to frustrations over what i would you know um air quotes culture wars about you know access to books um and and that kind of thing so it will be interesting to see you know now that the board of education is providing more clarity and identifying us what that really looks like specifically when it comes to supporting our LGBTQ students. Well, you mentioned about banning books and things like that. So the Department of Education work group has crafted a training that all school library workers must use in selecting books and other materials. That deadline is January 1st, but some members of the panel don't believe that its recommendations go far enough. This is according to the, the Tampa Bay Times. And the group includes parents and school media specialists. It was formed to carry out part of the new law called HB 1467 that was passed this year in the spring legislative session. So what can you tell us about HB 1467 and its impact on Hillsborough County Schools? Um, again, <laughs> kind of the clarity around that, like you said, they're just giving clarity as far as the training for when it goes to, to media center um, specialist. Um, we've had many media specialist center uh, specialists come and speak out about how important a lot of these books are in representing students in um, speaking true to their experiences um, and really helping them through hard times in their lives. So I'm really hopeful that the training will encompass something like that, but there's so many trainings being rolled out and we don't really have a lot of details about what that would look like. Um, so it's hard to say. I know that in Hillsborough, we have a really strong foundation of allowing each school to select a committee to kind of review any books that are being challenged and as a committee read those books together and then have a thoughtful discussion and decide you know locally per school whether or not they want to keep those books um, and I think that's a great way to do it to allow each school that autonomy to decide which books are right for them. Um, unfortunately, you know, that uh, is being challenged as well. We recently had a book that went through that challenge and people who were challenging it were so unhappy that they got a truck and they parked the truck outside the school kind of, you know, with the QR code, you know, asking people to write the school board, you know, being very frustrated about the details in the book. But to me, that's counterintuitive, because if you're trying to keep this book away from students parking a bus outside of the school, advertising the book and its contents, it's confusing to me that if that's your concern, why that would be the response. So, you know, again, it all feels very culture warish, and I don't really understand, you know, what the priority is of both our state leadership, our board of education, and some members of our community. I mean, right now we have so many issues in education. We have teachers and staff members who are literally writing us saying that they can't afford to pay their bills, their electricity, pleading with us for a livable wage because they're living in poverty. We don't have enough teachers and staff to make sure that we're supporting our ESE students who need the most support or make sure that we can safely get our kids to school for bus drivers. I mean, there's so many issues of education where our families are pleading for help and our staff members. This priority over books or restrooms or a word in a policy that doesn't affect the curriculum in schools is very confusing to me that that's the priority of both our leadership and members in our community right now. And we'll definitely get to issues of poverty among teachers and, and working conditions and salaries and things like that later in the show. We have a whole range of education issues that we're talking about this hour on WMNF's Tuesday Cafe. And that's with our guest, Jessica Vaughn, who is a member of the Hillsborough County School Board. So thank you for, again for joining us, Jessica, and thanks for talking about all these issues with us. You know, all this 
the culture, as you say, the culture war uh, aspect of this kind of heated up maybe during the pandemic and, the, and, and uh, when this group called Moms for Liberty started becoming high profile and going to school board meetings. So we'll talk about Moms for Liberty for just a second here, but let's start out with just kind of the tenor of school board meetings and whether that has uh, heated up in the last few years. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Um, you know, I was elected right in the height of the pandemic. So my first couple of years, I got to be what I feel like is, you know, in the front row of the culture wars of the nation. Um, and it was unlike anything I'd ever seen, you know, the frustration, the anger, the showboating. Um, it really felt like as an elective official um, that we were being abused, you know, semi stock There have been hate page uh, created, harassing phone calls. Even the, the tone of emails that we get are so angry and disrespectful and accusatory um, that it, it, it was not what I was prepared for when I was elected. Um, I do think that post pandemic though, now that um, there isn't such a conversation about masks it has kind of filtered down a little bit where, you know, we kind of see less engagement from people who are a bit more extreme in their views. Um, you know, there is Moms for Liberty and they're very passionate and they do seem to have a base of people who are also very passionate, but it seems to be located in one of our districts and not holistically throughout Hillsborough County and certainly not in my district, which is District 3. A lot of the concerns that we see coming out right now are kind of centralized to Bandit, uh, Brandon and Valrico, Riverview, and kind of the South County area. Um, so that's a little bit, you know, I like to take that into account when I'm speaking that it doesn't seem reflective of the majority of our community. Our guest is Jessica Vaughn, a member of the Hillsborough County School Board. We're talking about education issues in Florida. So far, we've talked about things like efforts to get rid of certain books. We've talked about uh, the Don't Say Gay Bill. In fact, that Jeff writes in and he says, it seems a liberal would think of the idea of LGBTQ awareness and respect while a conservative would have an idea of grooming. So this is Jeff's um, question here. He says, I've, I've observed this conflict going on for quite some time now, and I don't know how to find a fair solution. So maybe you could address Jeff's uh, concern here about how two different sides of the culture war is, as you've put it, um, deal with LGBTQ awareness. So I think that one of the things that worries me this most, the most is this concept of grooming and that talking or educating students when it comes to our sex education curriculum, because that's another thing that we've had a lot of um, concerns about and we've actually had a hearing about or books in context or you know anything where we talk about real world issues and arm students with solutions. The fact that it's labeled as grooming is very concerning to me because I think grooming is a very specific behavior behavior where a predator specifically earns the trust of students and families and it's 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 very important in identifying predators so when we use it to talk about education that makes some people uncomfortable or exposure to books and contacts um, with the word grooming it it makes me worried that we lose the value in that word and the ability to talk about how dangerous it is um, and that we we lose the power of educating our young people and our families what to be on the lookout for you know you know, again, talking, teaching sex education in context with trusted adults using anatomically correct words or reading a book where, you know, maybe it has some controversial things, but it's put in context where those are bad things and these are tragic things that happened and not glorifying isn't grooming. So it's very concerning to me that we're using that word interchangeably and, and making it more dangerous to identify that behavior. Well, thanks for that question, Jeff, and thanks for your answer, Jessica. A member of the Hillsborough County School Board, Jessica Vaughn, is joining us on WMNF's Tuesday Cafe for the rest of the hour. And you can email us at dj at wmnf.org or text 813-433-0885. If you'd like, you can call 813-239-9663. One thing we haven't talked about yet is, well, you kind of alluded to it when you said how some teachers were really struggling and getting burnt out and having so much extra work. And that kind of goes to the teacher shortage that's happening all over our region. What can you tell us about uh, the teaching shortage in Hillsborough? So our, our teaching shortage has maintained the same. Our vacancies haven't really gone up, not um, lack to us trying. We're being very aggressive about recruiting people. Um, but, you know, I'm very close knit with a lot of teacher 
uh, friends and people in the community, you know, and just the workload, um, whether it's, you know, being adaptive to the new testing, there's been so many changes, along with the parental rights, which has emboldened parents to kind of not see educators as partners, but more as adversarial, um, along with, you know, the lack of pay, um, has all is all kind of a perfect storm which is driving people out of education um, and it's really scary because you know ultimately there is a plan by some members of our state legislation and our leadership to privatize education and sometimes it feels like the things that they're prioritizing when it comes to like culture wars or other things is really just creating more chaos in our traditional public education system so if we privatize it and we see that happening more with charter schools and vouchers and you know there might might be some legislation that comes out that actually instead of giving money to school district it follows the child directly is all down this line of privatizing education and that's concerning on so many different levels you know the state the, the governor and the state legislation will say they've given the biggest teacher raises in the past few years which isn't saying very much because there haven't been very many in the last few years but that's aimed specifically at new teachers our mid-level and veteran teachers have not gotten the increases that they need and we see you know we have in Inflation higher than ever before. We see utility companies raising their rates. We see, you know, homeowners insurance going up drastically. The price to live in Florida, much less in Hillsborough County and inside the city, is astronomical. And so in order just to survive, teachers are and educators and parents and support professionals, not just teachers, are being forced out of education, which they're extremely passionate about. It's not an easy decision. They're heartbroken over it. We get emails every day pleading for help and support and for a livable wage, um, you know, so it's it's alarming as a school board member and somebody who's passionate about traditional public education and sees the value in it. And the Tampa Bay Times wrote today about the shortage of teachers, and it also pointed out that the problem could get worse after winter break because that's when many teachers typically retire or quit. So have you been hearing uh, either rumors or notices that the this problem might get worse after winter break. I mean, not even hearing it, I know several people who love education who just can't make it and, and can't come back to it, um, you know, and I feel like the goal is to transition education to teaching students on computer programs. Um, and then basically, you know, having glorified babysitters, maybe veterans or ex police officers who have a pension who can afford to make, you know, the small amount that we pay our teachers who can protect, you know, with arm, you know, with, with weaponry, our schools, and that that's the goal of, you know, the state leadership that we see right now. Um, and again, I find that alarming and dangerous and concerning. Our guest is Jessica Vaughn, who is a member of the Hillsborough County School Board, and I'm Sean Canan, and you're listening to WMNF's Tuesday Cafe. We're talking about education issues in Florida, and as you've, we've mentioned several times, Jessica, how um, teachers are writing to you and asking for a, a livable wage, and that brings up the, the point of the contract negotiation right now between the Hillsborough County School District and the teachers. And so let me read an update of, about a paragraph from what the Tampa Bay Times wrote last week about the, the update. The district and its teachers are taking their pay dispute to a third party in hopes of resolving an impasse that began in July. The union wants $13 million in pay raises this year, and that's based on cost of living increases and also that the district has COVID-enhanced reserves. And like last year, the district wants to offer pay supplements rather than raises. So in just a second, I'll ask you the difference between those two. But the teachers, they want their full credit for their year, years of service. I believe that's called STEPS. Mm -hmm. So what role does the special hearing master that's hearing all of this play in the contract? And what role do you play as the school board? Well, first, I, I just want to preface that bargaining and executive session where school board members help, you know, go over the budget is out of the sunshine and private. So I can't give a lot of details about it. And I can't appear to be negotiating with the union at all. Um, but I can give details in regards to so I do know the district offered one step. Um, and then in lieu of a second step, a bonus that's equivalent to that. Um, and that's kind of where we brought, where the union brought in the special magistrate because they believe that as 
teachers deserve their two years of, of full steps because with this bonus next year, teachers aren't raised at that pay grade, right? They may get the money for this year's or employees, but next year when it's, you know, for their salary, they're not getting that increase. So they have to come back again and negotiate. Um, so the magistrate, you know, we're at an impasse um, where no negotiation is going fo forward and this uh, the union took a poll from their membership and the membership supported impasse. So both sides, the district as well as the union presented their case to a special magistrate last week, um, who will then come back and, you know, go over our finances and make a recommendation whether or not they do think that within our budget, there is room for an increase or whether there isn't. And then from there, the board members will vote on upholding what the magistrate finds or not. Um, so it's still a pretty lengthy process. When you talk about we have gotten a lot of money from COVID relief. Now, that has been separated into certain buckets from the state. We haven't been able to spend it exactly how we want it. They broke it into five different budgets. Um, and there's also been very clear instructions on how we can send it and if spend it. And if we don't spend it on exactly what they want, they take the money back. So recently, we've been approving a lot of items in because we're afraid we're going to lose that money. They've, they've pulled the money back. Um, the issue is, even if that help builds up our reserves, the money that we have in savings, it doesn't, it's not a, a reoccurring fee, right? So when you make a salary increase for that $16 million we're talking about, that's got to come out of this year's budget, next year's budget, the budget after that. The money that we've got is a one-time money. So using, uh, guaranteeing a reoccurring amount of money using a lump sum isn't sustainable per the district's argument. So that's where um, a lot of that has come into play. Personally, I believe in paying our staff a livable wage, and that's the utmost priority. And I have personally voted no on several items that have come out of our general fund that are reoccurring that I believe we should be prioritizing paying our staff a livable wage. Um, and that's just me personally. I want to remind people that we're hearing from Jessica Vaughn, who is a school board member in Hillsborough County, and this is WMNF Tampa, 88.5 FM. Is 1046 in the morning, and we're talking about education issues in Florida. I'm Sean Canan. We got a text here from the 813 area code. Doesn't look like it's signed, but it says, thanks to school board member Jessica Vaughn from the teachers of Hillsborough County. We appreciate that you stand up for our rights to make a more livable wage. So thank you for that text, and thanks for listening in, area code 813. Uh, we also have an email question here from David who says, what does your guest think about the growing influence of step up for students and school vouchers in Florida? David says it seems like there are more and more low income students being taken out of public school and put in private schools as the voucher program grows. I have not seen that so much. I mean, I'm increasingly concerned about the voucher program because the interesting thing about all of these laws that have come out to protect students and give parents rights is that our charter schools and our private schools aren't beholden to them, um, which I find interesting because charter schools are publicly funded. So the fact that they're not being held to the same standards or laws that our traditional public schools are, are confusing for me. Um, so I haven't seen the influx between a lot of low income students moving to private schools and using vouchers. Personally, I have seen an influx going to a lot of the charter schools. Unfortunately, what seems to happen is either one, if the student has you know, ESE issues, they need a 504, they need accommodations, a lot of the charter schools aren't able to accommodate that. So they then send them back to the traditional public school. Unfortunately, it's usually after account has been done. So they get the funding for that student. And then the traditional public schools, our district is um, the one who has to provide services without the funding for that student. And also, a lot of times with low income families, unfortunately, sometimes there's trauma, sometimes there's behavioral issues that need, you know, special understanding and special training to deal with some of those communities. And as well, when they go to charter schools, a lot of these students are then dismissed or sent back to our traditional public schools after they've recouped the funding that goes with the students. So it's incredibly challenging. One of our legislation priorities as a school board has been to ask for more periods throughout the year where we count students and we break up the funding. So if a student has transitioned between charter schools or public schools, we're able to recoup some of that funding so we can make sure we're paying for the paras or the behavioral support people or any of the things that we need to best support those students and make sure they have access to the same academics as all of our other students. Jessica, I want to ask you about uh, two things that the governor's office sent to reporters yesterday that had to do with 
how Florida ranks. And uh, I'll tell you where these are from as well so that you can kind of um, give us an idea of, of what this might mean. So the governor's office sent out an email yesterday, had rankings from, from two conservative education surveys. One said Florida ranks as the number one state in the country for parent empowerment. That's according to the Center for Education Reform's Parent Power Index. And it measures the extent to which states have policies in place that put students first, value the unique needs of every family, and empower parents to oversee their child's education. Each state was ranked using three criteria, choice programs, charter schools, and innovation. Overall, Florida scored 94.6%, leading all 50 states and the District of Columbia. So your thoughts on Florida being number one in that survey? I mean, that's not surprising if you're using the fact that they're looking at charter schools and our parental rights bill. And I think that, you know, that has been something that the governor has gotten a lot of traction on because anyone who is a parent wants to have the right of your children's education, right? Parents' rights should be something that we consider and something that's at the forefront. I'm a parent. I have a child in school. I want to make sure I have the right to guide his education. Unfortunately, what I don't see enough discussion about, right, education is a partnership. So what about our educators' rights? And more importantly, what about our student rights? We don't have a lot of conversation about that. And the other challenge that I'm seeing when we're talking about parental rights and placing a huge amount of emphasis on that is what happens when parental but rights butt up against each other, right? And we've seen that time and time again when it's come to access of books or mask wearing. One parent might feel like something is important for their safety of their child and another parent might disagree. So when you leave all of the decisions around parental rights and there's no experts or people who you know um, are able to oversee those decisions, what happens when you have a conflict of parental rights? Um, so it's not surprising to me because there have been the parental rights bill and because there are so many choices aside from traditional public education, I don't think that means that our education system is getting um, the support and um, the financial support that it needs to be successful when you only focus on one, per one, one member of the relationship's rights. And the specific rankings in that inside that ranking is that Florida was number one for digital and personalized learning, number one for choice programs, and number two in the nation for charter schools. So here's the other uh, survey that the governor sent to reporters yesterday. It said that Florida ranked number one in the nation on the Heritage Foundation's Education Freedom Report Card, which analyzes both the quantity and quality of a state school's a state's school choice offerings. Nearly half of Florida students have chosen an educational option outside of their zoned traditional public school, such as open enrollment, family empowerment, scholarships, charter schools, virtual education vouchers, education and savings accounts, and more. So the Heritage Foundation's Education Freedom Report Card, Florida ranked number one. Well, yeah, we're oversaturated with choice, right? Which isn't necessarily a good thing. I mean, again, choice is great. We all want choices. I want choices as a parent. Um, however, when you oversaturate the market with so many choices that don't necessarily have the same guidelines when it comes to consistency or expectations, you're really missing the opportunity to make sure that our traditional public schools are the best that they can be, right? And I often say this, and I really believe this, that at the heart of things, all parents want the same thing. Um, they want something that's close, a school where their children are getting a great education, where they're valued, where they're supported, where they feel safe, you know, and if we would take the resources where we're spreading it out between all these different choices and options and just invested that into making sure that our traditional public schools offered that to our parents, I don't think that parents would need so many choices. And when you have to rely on choice to guide your child's education, that creates an equity, right? Because what about those parents that don't have the options to maneuver between those choices or, you know, that there's a um, a digital divide and they can't access our choice window or they don't have transportation to a specific magnet school. You know, once you start to make it all about choice and you're not focusing on making every school, neighborhood school, the best that it could be for every student, you start to build even more inequity into our education system. And that's concerning. Our guest is Jessica Vaughn, a member of the Hillsborough County School Board. You're listening to WMNF Tampa, 88.5 FM. It's 1054 in the morning. If you'd like to call in and ask a question or make a comment about education in Florida, the number is 813-239-9663. And John Dunn will be happy to answer your call and we'll get you onto the line. 
You can also email us at dj at wmnf.org, or you can text 813-433-0885. So Jessica, the, the school district in Hillsborough County is going to be looking at school boundaries coming up. What should people, <laughs> and that's a sigh, it looked like a frustration from you. What what uh, What is it that made you sigh and what can people look for in while we do that process? So I can say that personally, I've been frustrated with this boundary redrawing. Um, originally, when we started having the conversation, um, I felt like we were all in agreement that it was an opportunity to, one, make sure that our schools are drawn so that some aren't overwhelmed and some aren't underutilized, which currently we have right now. We have some schools where you know they're not nearly close to capacity and other ones where they're over capacity. So that part of the analysis is good. But I also thought it was an opportunity, and I thought that everyone agreed with me to draw more equity into it because our school boundaries haven't been revisited since they were redlined right and they were segregated by class and racial just racial divides um, and so every conversation i've had I've, I've talked about racial and economic um, equity being important in the revision of this and so far the meetings i've had with the consultants have um made me realize that it's not been a priority in some of the options that we have. So um, personally, I'm frustrated with that um, and I'm gonna be very clear. So what I would hope is number one, um, regardless of you know my frustrations, that people are engaged in this process, especially a, a lot of our marginalized communities where we're gonna see a lot of the change and in, in the city limits, especially specifically in East Tampa, and that people are really aware. Um, we're about to have a lot of town halls and community meetings where people have the opportunity opportunity to come and give input and see the options. Right now, the consultants that we hired have narrowed it down to three different options um, that people can kind of see how that would affect them and what that looks like. Um, you know, again, my frustration is I feel like I was misled through this process and that we were going to focus more on making sure that schools have racial and social economic diversity because we find those schools to be the most successful. And we have examples here in Hillsborough County that has a lot of diversity in both and all of our students are academically extremely successful. Um, so I guess we'll see what happens. <laughs> We've hit on a lot of issues so far, but are there any education issues that that you're looking at that you're thinking about that we haven't talked about yet? Um, I am concerned again, and I think this is, you know, lack of, again, support and staffing, but, you know, some of the concerns about supporting our ESC students and making sure that we have the staff to make sure that we're providing accommodations, that our staff knows what those accommodations are, you know, we, I think, have realized in education how important it is to differentiate our learning and making sure we're doing everything to meet students, and I feel like we've had a real challenge because we haven't gotten a lot of support and prioritization when it comes to our ESE students. So I think that's something we need to talk about. I'm really worried about the new standardized testing and what that's going to look like. And, you know, standardized testing in general, whether that's an accurate portrayal of our student success. You know, I feel like across the nation and in Hillsborough County, what we have is really a reading crisis. And instead of constantly focusing on standardized tests, what we need to do is focus back on phonics and, you know, the value in a reading and what that looks like. So, I mean, I could, in less than five minutes, I I could spend an hour talking about what we should be focusing on education, what I'm concerned about. But those are some things that I'm going to be focusing on going into the new year. Well, Jessica, I want to thank you very much for coming on WMNF's Tuesday Cafe today. Thank you so much. It's always a pleasure. Have me back again. I sure will. Thanks so much, Jessica Vaughn. Jessica Vaughn is a member of the Hillsborough County School Board and has joined us so far on WMNF's Tuesday Cafe. Thanks for being on and you can watch this full interview beginning this afternoon. It'll be on our website, wmnf.org. I, I wanted to uh, read this last email that came in that, was kind of, that wasn't on the education topic. So that's um, why we have just a second or two left in the show. I'm going to read this email that Charles sent in from Palmetto. He says, I do not believe the current solutions to Florida's homeowners insurance problems will be any more effective than the last half dozen plus industry sponsored solution solutions over the last 25 years. I believe the basic financial structure of insurance companies is a big part of the problem and a partial solution. When banks fail in number, the feds require the banks to hold more capital, more reserves, never hear that about homeowners insurance companies. So uh, Charles restates, he says, frankly, you never ever hear of the state requiring more cash reserves or greater reinsurance multiple, no matter how many insurers fail. And Charles concludes, 
further allowing development in or near flood zones, allowing rebuilding in or near flood zones, not addressing the 100-year flood events that seemingly occur every 20 years, and not increasing building codes statewide to higher wind speeds does not help in keeping costs down. So there's a lengthy email that I wanted to read from Charles, who is talking about our first topic of the day, which was Florida's special session on insurance that is going on as we speak. So thank you for that, Charles. And thanks to everyone who listened in and sent in emails or texts today. Really appreciate you being a part of the Tuesday Cafe. And I also want to thank my guest, Jessica Vaughn. And I want to thank our phone screener, John Dunn. You have been listening to WMNF's Tuesday Cafe. I'm Sean Canan. If you like the programming on 88.5 FM, please consider making a donation at WMNF.org. And I want to thank everyone who donated during our recent membership drive and who is contributing during our end of the year fundraiser. In this time slot tomorrow, Shelly is going to host Midpoint at 11, sorry, at 10 on Wednesday. But next up is Wavemakers with Janet and Tom Sherberger. Their guest today is Tampa City Council Chair Joe Citro. They'll talk about the police chief, city council, and Citro's days as a WMNF DJ. So that's coming up after NPR headlines. You're listening to WMNF Tampa, St. Petersburg, Sarasota, Lakeland, and Bradenton. Thanks so much for listening to 88.5 FM and supporting WMNF Tampa.